Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hey, I'm glad you're with us on Life Support. And what we're going to do today is what we always do, and that is tell a story that I hope will encourage you. I hope you'll see Jesus in a brand new way. And, you know, he is always there. He always steps into these very difficult situations of our lives, and and God will never forsake you. And the man that's with me, his name is Frank Mitchell. He's a trauma nurse. He's written a book called From the Other Side of the Bed. And the subtitle is really intriguing. It is a trauma nurse's personal and family's perspective during his fight for life while being infected with COVID. So there's a lot to unpack here. Frank, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So this book is really fascinating to me because you um, had spent time, you know, ministering to people as a nurse. That's what you did. You know, you help people. You, 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 you went to work to help. Now all of a sudden you find yourself... Um, you have COVID, you're a very sick man, and yet there were so many people, as you put it, just lined up by God to minister to you. Um, tell me what it was like when you first found out that you were sick, because you had dealt with all of these people that had struggled with this. So when I, it was almost, you know, the, the, you have the grieving things, you have the denial and things like that that go in the stages of, of grief, but mine was trying to intellectualize everything and try and see if I can't figure out what's going wrong. And I think what that was was like a defense mechanism for, for keeping me from getting overwhelmed. So I kept trying to triage myself and trying to trying to help others who were trying to help me. Um, it was very it was very humbling um, having somebody have to help clean you. Um, mm. Somebody who couldn't touch you because they thought you'd be sick. And then on the inside of me, I'm going, I know how contagious this is. Am I going to get this person sick? And they'll get somebody else sick. And so it was, it's very humbling. It was scary. Um, it was very, I mean, I was in isolation, but it felt very isolative. It's like a traumatic island of, of, of trauma, of, of, of crisis. Um, it's it, you're you feel like you're alone and you're kind of waving at ships trying to say hey I'm I'm here I'm 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 still a person, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where I felt God's presence is because that army that we talked about stepped up all these people all these people that shouldn't have been there were there um, friends that I have didn't forget they did everything they could reach out I had one person um, I hate just having to pull out one person because there's so many and I don't mean to overlook people but I have a very dear friend Mike who stepped up to my wife right away and says what do you need mm -hmm. and it was an open what end do you need and all this stuff started and, and kind of blossomed uh, what we had as a good relationship family to family but right, it's one of our dearest friends but it's kind of like showing the importance of somebody who said I'm not going to sit back and go who am I how can I yeah. even think I'm somebody to help and somebody who said forget this I'm here with you. What can I do to help? That, that is so important to know. When uh, my wife was, was fighting cancer, I had three small kids, and um, there were so many people that were prescriptive. They, they decided what we needed. Yes. Um, and, and what happens then is you, 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 you appreciate the heart, but it becomes a burden, becomes a, um, uh, just something else you have to carry. The people that I began to really want to be around are those who had that kind of an attitude. Hey, I'm here. That's all I had to say. I'm here. Right. Praying for you, and let us know if you need anything. Done. We, you know, and and then I would reach out if I needed it. But I think that's such a good lesson for us all to learn is, you know, we don't have to be the one. Right. To fix it, because you can't. Can't. Can't fix somebody's pain. No. You can be there with them while they're going through it. Yep. Um, it's kind of like watching a sick child who's uh, it's simply if they're throwing up or something. You can't Yeah. stop it. Yeah. And you want easy. to, but you can't. Right. So your wife was not allowed to be in the room with you, right. um, which, by the way, is you know something that breaks my heart about COVID because I've, I've had so many people that have just said, like, you know, this person has died, this person has died, this person has died. I couldn't be there. The trauma of that's going to take a long time to unwind. But at least we have technology, praise God for that, 
So you had your wife on a on an iPad, right? right. And she was there uh, via the iPad, which isn't the same, but at least she was there, and God used that, didn't he? I can't tell you how warming it was to look over and have her just pop her head up when the power was there and say, hey, how you doing? Because she could see me roll over. I think she even took a picture of it. There's a picture of it in the book of me sleeping. She just took a screen capture. Um, but to hear that A voice, not somebody's voice, this medical that I don't know, but a voice that I knew yeah. and being there with me was just heartwarming. But all of the people that come in to your life when you're, I mean, you're, you're a pastor. Yep. You know what it's like when I'm sick now I'm supposed to be the one that's helping. That's what I've been called to do. And now I'm draining the resources from people who should be there with somebody else. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just an emptying feeling. It's like the bottom of the well comes up to mind, you know, preaching from the empty well. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just odd to feel that when you're so used to going, okay, I'm focused now. And that's what I think what the original question was, is like, um, and what would it feel like when I was like, I'm, go- I'm at the end of the well, so what am I going to do? I'm going to turn that inward. How can I help this person help me? <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about COVID because I'm in the bed with COVID and yeah, I can't right. think straight. Right. Right. How can that's I help right. you? Yeah. Uh, I think one of the funny stories about how that first manifested itself is when I got out of the place that put coils in my splenic artery that ruptured. Um, I come into the room and I'm in this bed. Um, it's a, and I'm kind of ruining his section of the book, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm rolling into the room and I'm really delirious. I'm still kind of baking off the medication that they gave me to, pre- to do with the, the procedure. And I'm not breathing well because it, it's starting to attack my lungs. And I rolled into the room and I remember seeing like this rectangular window with two heads looking into it. And I, the bed didn't feel like a normal bed. It kind of felt like this table, like it was round and hard. And as I was rolling in, I'm going, huh, this must be a hot air balloon training camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, there's so many of those. In the yeah, world, they're, they're in the everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I see them <laughs> on every corner. So as I rolled in, uh, the thing that woke me up was my, my IV pump, uh, something that was alarming. And so in the defensive mode, like I'm trying to say I'm going to help, is, a, oh, an IV pump's going off. And what does a good nurse do when an IV pump's going? Let's fix the pump. So I'm attached to lines and monitors and everything, and I have bed rails up, and in this delirious state, I climbed up over the the rails, I got out of bed, I go to the pump, and I'm starting to reprogram it, and the nurses had to pop the door open, they're screaming, get back in bed, you're going to fall, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to make us, and get back. I'm like, and my response was like, internally, boy, these hot air balloon training campuses, (laughs) they're really uptight. Okay, I'm just trying to help. Yeah, no more hot air ballooning for me. (laughs) I don't want to be around these people. But it's so interesting that you say that because, you know, in your profession and my profession, we're wired to to want to help people. Yes. Um, and when we are the ones that need the help, um, it, it is just just terribly difficult to, to ask for it. Well, I finally got COVID not that long ago. I had avoided it. Um, and I got it on a Saturday, of course. And, um, and you know, everything was done. The sermon's all written, everything ready to go. To just start calling people and saying, um, not going to be there, can you? And, of course, everybody is like, well, of course, of course, of course, of course. Uh, but you, you you, have this feeling like I'm, I'm somehow, I'm stealing your life away by asking for help. Right. What I'm really doing is blessing them because they get a chance to help. And asking for help is so humbling and hard. It's humbling and hard. And I kind of think with everything that everything's been going on, it's almost like God reached in to say, you got to remember, I'm in charge of this. You're not. Yeah, that's right. And so God's going, look, use your army. It's yep. there. Yep. Reach out to it or pray for it and I'll send it. But remember, you're, you're not all that. It's kind of like you need to slow down. You need to focus back in on what's important. Yeah, and then being isolated for those five days um, where I just had to be basically in my bedroom for five days. And I couldn't really do anything. I didn't feel well enough to really you know, do like tons of study and, and I, I had to keep telling myself, it's okay. You're, 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 you're supposed to be getting well. It's yes. okay if you just sit, it, sit, it, just watch TV. I can't, I can't, I can't. I got to make, I got to make use of this time. <laughs> like I, this is wasted time. I can't do this. And it's like, God was just saying, no, no, you know, you need to take care of yourself. And, and that, that was a good experience for me to learn that, but I probably will never really learn it. Um, but I'm getting better. And I think that what you went through is, is such a harsh reality check. I mean, you were on the edge of dying. You were, you were right there. 
And I can't imagine how that must have felt and how lonely that must have been. You're in pain. You know, being in pain is is uh, is kind of an underrated sort of a terrible thing, isn't it? Yes. I mean, when it's chronic like that. I mean, you had day after day after day after day. And they're, they're pounding you with pain medicine. And yeah. the one thing that people expect is when you get the pain medicine, it goes away. It, it doesn't. It's blocking chemical receptors in your head. So the pain's still there. And, and I, quite frankly, could feel it. I could feel the pain through the pain medicine, which was even more frustrating. Right. But it just doesn't go away. But it, it's kind of cool because the I know the military kind of looks at it like pain is your friend. It's reminding you that you're still alive, even though you're going through a traumatic event. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So you've got to use that to keep going. And that's where that, that phrase from the Bible I was talking about. I, I turned. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Right. But I'm putting my eyes on you. Right. And God brought you to this really, really kind of the end of your rope spot where you had to just cry out and say I got nothing and and what was that like I tell you that and you've had COVID so you understand this yeah. when, when you get COVID and these other illnesses that are going around you are unplugged yeah you very become, much so yeah, I kind of joke and say you become one with the couch your bed and YouTube or I know uh, iTunes or something on the, <laughs> on yeah. the video screen so yeah. you can do it's something to give your mind something else to do other than stare at the ceiling because that's all you're going to do I watched every um, sports playoff series uh, <laughs> you know, teams I didn't even know who played on them and that's all I did for <laughs> but yeah it, it's a very isolating feeling like that when, um, when you reach the screen that says sorry you've reached the end of Netflix yeah you know, then you know you're in big trouble. <laughs> well, there's nothing to watch on those channels anymore. Exactly. Anyway. Um, but you you learned a lot through that. I mean, you here you are, and now you're still nursing. Yes. And so how do you take what you learned, and how has it changed how you minister to others? So it, it goes back to I try to stay as humble as I can as a nurse. I don't know everything. That's why I love being in the emergency department because I learn something new every single day. I find something else new. It, exp it expresses itself in a new way every day. Um, I've actually found myself now sitting kind of closer to the patients. I did before, but as I sit down and listen to what they're going through, I talk to them and I say, you know, hey, Let's find out what's going on with you. And some people get mad because we ask that a thousand times when you're in your hospital. Yeah. But how are you doing? Yeah. What did you do? What happened today? Right. But every time you ask that, another page kind of opens up. And I used to sit down and I introduce myself and I'll tell them, hey, I'm your nurse. And I like to look at you before your chart. Can you tell me why you're here? What can we do? What can I do to help you? What can I do to be with you? Because we're going to do both. We're in this together now. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you have this wall of defenses that you can't bash your way through. You kind of have to peel a little wing back and say, hey, in there, I know you're scared. Or you're, you probably have a lot of pain. You think them, I'm going to hurt you. Um, you're humble. <laughs> you're not wearing anything under there. You, you, yeah. you, know, you feel yeah. extremely vulnerable. Yeah. But maybe we can talk. Yeah. And so if you can make your way through that wall around that defense, and that's where I found myself getting through it. And at the end of a lot of these experiences, I kind of feel sometimes which I never, f I hadn't felt this heavy before, but I feel it now. If I'll ask him, can I pray for you? Um, I'm actually thinking of a doctor who recently passed. was a good friend of mine. Um, I had the rare opportunity at just talking with him, and he's in the bed, he's sick. And I said, Doc, can I pray for you? And as soon as I said that, he just started sobbing. And he was mm -hmm. like, yes. Mm -hmm. And I got to pray for him. He died a week later. Mm -hmm. And... I can't tell you that feeling that I had that I got to pray for a trauma doctor in the ER who'd been there for years. And I got to pray for him. Mm -hmm. it just, it's just, it's humbling. It's an, a position of honor. And that's something that's opened up for me is I became part of his army. And I, I see that as a new opportunity of stepping in, stepping up, even though, like I said, who am I? I'm a human. I picture us kind of like being a two continents separated by an ocean. Because that's what it is. You're over here or you're in pain. I'm over here. I'm trying to help whatever or vice versa. We are still connected. Even though there's water, there's ground underneath that water. And in humanity, we're connected. Yeah. So if we can find that connection, make that connection, we have the ability to step up, step in, and be with somebody. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you're actually in the hospital, um, you know, at least for me, I'm I'm eyeing the nurses, and I'm th I, I'm within about 
five minutes, I'm saying, I hope I get that one. (laughs) Or I hope I get that one. Just because of their demeanor. Yes. Because of how they're talking to other nurses. And it really does make a huge difference in your comfort level. They're talking to you, too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and sometimes, um, and and they're all busy, and so, you know, you don't judge. But it's, it's really interesting what you're saying, because have you ever had anybody say, no, don't pray for me? No. No. Never. And that's a good lesson for all of us in any area of life. You're talking to a clerk, and you you have a long conversation, and they're sharing something about their family, and you're in the store, and you look around. There's not a lot of people there, and you say, could I just say a quick prayer for you? I'll about 100% guarantee you that they're not going to say no. I can think of one that was very shocking. I had a, um, a very – I don't know the ranking within the Jewish faith. I just know he was a rabbi, and he was fairly uh, fairly up there. He had some assistance with them. Um, He's in there, he's talking, he had the, the traditional, uh, which was a stereotypical accent. And I, I, it was just fun because I know this guy, I've seen him before. And yeah. I've been called in as one of the, I call myself part of the Dracula squad. Um, I'm, I go in with an ultrasound, the, I, call, I get called for difficult IV placements. And he was a difficult IV placement. I found it, I hit it, it, it got in fine. And he says, wow, that was really good. And I said, I said that wasn't me, that was him. And the rabbi looked at me, and he says, ah, and he's looking at the two um, like gentlemen he had with him. You see? Yeah. You see this? This guy here, he's a man of faith. <laughs> Look around his neck. He's got a thing of faith. And I'm like, can I pray for you? And he says, of course. Wow. So I'm praying for yeah. a rabbi. I'm like, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. cool. That's pretty cool. You're, well, you're bringing God into the, you know, you're, you're a believer who's bringing your faith. Uh, but more than that, you're bringing an awareness of God into their lives when they may have no awareness of that at all. And can imagine, like, here you are, you're really sick, and you're a believer. You've got that at least. But imagine the person laying there, no family. Uh, you're, you've got COVID. You're really ill. You're terrified. You don't have an awareness of God. Um, somebody needs to bring the awareness of God into that person's life. And the way to do it is not to hit them over the head. The way to yes. do it is what you're doing, and that is to love them. One of the things that touched me, one of the, in, in part of the book here, uh, my, my, my girl's got a chance to write. Um, my oldest daughter was really speechless, didn't know what to do, couldn't find something to do. And one of the things she said that she remembered that she did, and it's the only thing that she, she thought she could do to help, uh, the people who are seeing the video can see that I have a cross. Uh, she said, I got to send dad his cross. He wasn't able to take that with him. He was too sick when he left. It was in the middle of the night. Um, so she sent that to the ICU. And so the importance of this cross is I bought this when we went down to Haiti for the earthquake. Uh, we took a team from the ER to do some ER work down down in Peschenville. And I just wanted people to know who was walking into the room. Not, I can quote every Bible verse and everything mm-hmm. like that. And I'm all mm-hmm. that. Just what kind of person is coming mm-hmm. into a version of faith. And I get that all the time now of, I like your cross, I like your cross, I like your cross. Uh, coworkers, I know that cross is here, hi, right, Frank. And this cross that I, I still, you can see I have it here with me, um, it's been on every, um, in Haiti and all the rooms and everything I was there, it, it's been in every single room every single day since I think I bought it in 2010. Um, any, anybody I prayed with, anybody who's passed, anybody who's made it and stopped me in the middle of the hallway said, I recognize that face and there's that cross. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that says a lot. So tell me how your health is right now. So I still have some residuals. Um, that you, it, it, with the little pauses in here, the little bit of COVID fog is still there. Um, I have rebounding issues because I no longer have a spleen, a functional one. Uh, the artery that was feeding it had to be uh, cauterized and closed from the inside to stop bleeding. So that makes the spleen no longer get its... Uh, nutrients, et cetera, so it's dying. Um, down line from that is the pancreas. My pancreas took a hit on the head and a tail of the pancreas. And long term, but it's called a necrotizing pancreatitis is what I developed. So it started fighting itself. Um, so there's issues with that. There's issues with clotting that still can occur. Um, I've ended up with some uh, GI bleeds in the, in the hospital from uh, various different uh, damage that's occurred down line from that pancreatic head. Um, but Health-wise, I am so blessed. There's so many more people that were so much more sick than I am. Mm-hmm. 
some people that were intubated. And I, I, I kind of uh, believe that since I asked them, do not intubate me, that's why you and I are able to talk. Because in the beginning, they were just tubing everybody, putting yeah. an, an endotracheal tube into everybody, making them breathe, and that caused problems. So right. they're more hesitant to do that right now unless you have to get that airway protected. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing that they did, but, I mean, what do you do? The person's – I literally saw a person with a, with a pulse ox, a little thing on their finger that reads how much oxygen is making it to their hands. And I'm using the word literally, and I mean this literally, right. not the way that yeah. the youth generations use, sure. you know. I walk into the room, I'm looking up at this monitor, and the guy's talking, but he's confused. And this number should be for between 94 and 98 percent. His was 11. Oh, my. And I know it's not accurate anywhere below 60. But I kind of used my little radio and said, uh, I need a doctor in this room. And nobody showed up. And I said, uh, second call, doctor in this room, <laughs> SPO2 of 11. And all of a sudden, there's like eight people. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah. in that case, you know, what do you do? You can't say, don't give him oxygen. That's don't right. take, you, you yeah. need to do it. You got to do what you got to right. do. Right. Well, we're, we're going to pray for you now that we know you. And tell me um, where I can get the book, From the Other Side of the Bed. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes & Noble. Uh, there's a Kindle version. There's an iBook, uh, G, uh, the Google Books. Um, I've found it on Walmart.com. There's some on... Uh, well, if it's on Walmart.com... You know. You've made it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, n- not everybody gets to be on Walmart.com. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that uh, makes... If you look at the book, uh, the picture that's on the front there is actually taken in a trauma room. It's a cool picture. And that's me uh, with my team around me. Wow. So uh, that's I wanted it to go out that it's supposed to recognize the team that was there, the teams that can be there, the people that can be there for you. Step up. So that's the big message. Step up. Be a part of what's going on. Join that Pray army. Pray for wisdom. Yes. Yeah. If I'm you, glad you dropped by. Thank you so much for having me. It was really good me. to meet you. Likewise.